special guest, reporter for MassLive.com, uh, Chris Cotillo. Jake Palmacki. Very special guest today, Steve Peral. Los Angeles Dodgers prospect, Jimmy Titus. Jerry Weinstein. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Behind the Dish Sports. Thank you for tuning in to another podcast here. And we have an incredible guest for you guys today. He is a 305-game winner in Major League Baseball, 10-time All-Star, 2-time Cy Young Award winner, 4-time Silver Slugger Award winner, 1995 World Series champion, and World Series MVP, Tom Glavin. Yeah, it's great baseball player, great pitcher, obviously Hall of Famer, uh, even better interview. We did a great job with this one. I think you're really going to enjoy it. So let's just hop right into it. One and two. And Glavin finishes the... Here's the 2-2. Struck him out. Bounce back to Glavin. 3-2. Hit out the second. Blouser's got it. And the Braves win it. On a nice pitching job by Tom Glavin. It's a one, two, three, bottom half of the... Doug Drabeck. And there it is. Career strikeout number 1,000. Tom Glavin wants that baseball. He punches him out. Inside. And get him, and the ball game is over, and Tom Glavin has 20, and the Braves have won 100 games. Every half of the night. He's gone for the sixth... Ever. What a way to finish. So, Mr. Glavin, thank you so much for joining the podcast today. We really appreciate having you. And uh, let's start off, you know, a member of the Big Three down in Atlanta. And something that, you know, you guys are known for is the golf game and kind of this the off the field stuff and always on the golf course. And you've had the opportunity to golf with an impressive collection of golfers, everybody from Arnold Palmer to Tiger Woods. Uh, so just quickly, who was your first golfer that you're, who is the, your favorite golfer that you've ever golfed with before? And do you have any crazy stories from the golf course or any fun stories from the golf course that people might not know, but that you think they should? Um, man, that's good. All good questions. Um, I mean, it's hard to argue playing with, uh, you know, Arnold Palmer and Tiger Woods. Um, you know, I played with Arnold when he was uh, a little bit older, you know, back half of it or back end of his career. Um, certainly um, wasn't uh, the Arnold Palmer at his best, so to speak. Um, but, man, you, know, you talk about an experience. Um, you know, I mean, he's golf royalty. So um, to have the opportunity to play with him both in a tournament environment and then just a casual environment. Um, Pretty special. Um, you know, he, as everybody knows, just a great ambassador of the game, um, was a ton of fun to play with, great storyteller. Um, so don't ask me to tell any stories because I don't remember him. But, <laughs> you know, I know he was he constantly chatted all the way around the golf course. And then, you know, on the other side, we, we had a chance to play with Tiger a lot. Um, you know, when we moved spring training to Orlando with the Braves, you know, we'd play with Tiger – once or twice a spring. Um, so to be able to play with him and, and, you know, at the height of, of his career, um, it was pretty cool. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you watch the way he hits the ball, how far he hits the ball, all those things. It's crazy. And, and, you know, I think the first time I played with him, um, I remember we were going, we were walking to the eighth green. Uh, we both, I hit my shot just off the green. He hit his shot in the green side bunker. And as we were walking towards our next shot, I looked at him and I said, hey, you forgot your putter. And he just kind of looked at me. He said, oh, I won't need it. <laughs> I'll be damned. He chipped it to about two inches from the hole. So I guess he didn't need it. Um, but, you know, stuff like that was crazy. I remember that was, you know, that time, the first time we played with him was kind of at the height of, um, if you recall, that Nike commercial that he did on the driving range where he flipped the ball up with his iron and, you know, bounced it like three or four times and then hit it. Um, well, same thing on the 18th green. He had a chip shot, didn't bring his putter, almost made it, um, and then just kind of knocked it in the hole with his with his iron and then pulled it out of the hole with the iron, flip, 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 boom, hits it 
over the trees into this lake behind the 18th green. And I was just kind of like, Oh my God, man, that's crazy. How do you do that? And then he took my club, which is left-handed, did the same thing left-handed. <laughs> and I was just like, it's crazy. You know, that's, that's <laughs> pretty amazing. And he's like, yeah, that's, you know, what happens when you get a 22 year old kid with a lot of time on his hands, I can do those kinds of things. So I was like, yeah, all right, I guess you can. So, but he was a ton of fun to play with too. That's awesome. That's awesome. And just kind of to follow up on, uh, with golf here. So you and Maddox and Smolty were on the golf course a lot and it's pretty storied. Like I said earlier, how would you say that, uh, those trips kind of impacted your relationship with teammates and team camaraderie? Um, you know, it was one of those things that, you know, truth be told, we, we took some criticism for how much golf we played. Um, you know, obviously it, it correlated with, um, if the team wasn't playing well or one of us wasn't pitching well, then obviously it was because we played too much golf. That was, that was the easy thing to go after. Um, but you know, and it couldn't have been any further from the truth. Look, I think for all three of us, it was twofold. Number one, it was an outlet. You know, the, the baseball season is a long season and it's a grind. You play 162 games in 180 days. Uh, so there's not a lot of off days. There's not a lot of off time. Um, it can be very redundant and it can be obviously very stressful. Um, so for us, it was our release to get away from, um, you know, the, the rigors of the schedule and the season and all that stuff, you know. Um, we kind of looked at it as a good thing too. I mean, because if we were getting up at, 7.30 or 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning to go play golf, then we weren't going out drinking after a game. So, uh, you know, we were going back to the hotel and, and going to bed and getting up playing golf. So, um, you know, it was therapeutic, like I say. But, you know, truth be told, as much as it was an outlet, we ended up talking about baseball 90% of the time, uh, whether it was, you know, a series that we just had or a series we were getting ready to have or somebody we were getting ready to face or just – you know, um, venting about um, struggles individually or struggles as a team, whatever the case may be. So a lot of it was uh, baseball-related conversation. So, um, you know, it, it served its purpose more than anything else, I think, for us to have that outlet to get away from sitting around a hotel all day long um, and, and that kind of thing. And, and, and it never once interfered with any one of us in terms of our preparation or being ready to pitch or any of that stuff. And I think that's, you know, that's why Bobby Cox was so okay with it. Cause he knew um, that we weren't going to let it get in the way of what we needed to do. Yep. Yep. No, definitely important to have an outlet. And I think you see a lot of other major league guys starting to do more outlets now, like, you know, guys like Trevor may go and do gaming or anything, but, um, Super awesome to talk about golf and obviously a huge part of you and the big threes, like uh, just lifestyle and the way you play. But to transition into a little more baseball talk here, the first thing that we thought of, obviously, aside from the amazing Hall of Fame career and everything, was that you pitched in pretty much the height of the steroid era. Mm -hmm. And we just think that is insanely impressive that you were able to dominate the way you did in that era. And I'm just wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about what it was like pitching in that era. Um, you, you know, I mean, I guess looking back at it, it, it was, I guess it wasn't easy, obviously. Uh, um, you know, I, I think, um, a lot of us were naive, uh, I think a little bit as to how, how prevalent it was, how widespread it was. At least I know I was, um, but you know, I mean, it, you could see the game, the game was changing. Um, and, and it, it, it kind of coincided too with, a lot of the new ballparks that were starting to get built, like Camden Yards, were band boxes. So you could kind of make an excuse that the ballparks had something to do with why guys, so many guys were hitting home runs. Um, you know, we had a juice ball era of our own um, that we dealt with. Uh, so all those things were going on while the kind of steroid suspicions were going on too. And, and you know, I know, like for me personally – you saw how, how things changed pretty dr dramatically from the standpoint of, you know, when I got called up to the big leagues in the late 80s, I could, probably, I could probably name five guys in the National League that I was worried about being able to hit a home run to any part of the ballpark. There just weren't many guys that could do it, you know. Um, guys who could go opposite field were your Dale Murphys, Jack Clarks, uh, Dave Kingmans, guys like that. Um, and the rest of the guys, they, you know, you weren't worried about them taking you out of the ballpark to the opposite field. And that's 
a big reason why I, I learned how to pitch the way that I did because I knew, you know, if, if I make a mistake on the outer half of the plate, it's going to take two or three hits to score a run. Um, and then all of a sudden it started to change to where, you know, now this started to be, you know, like one guy in every lineup. And then there was two or three guys in every lineup. And then you had teams that had a lineup full of guys that could take you opposite field. So, you know, that's when it kind of started getting past, uh, all right, well, this isn't just the ballpark and this isn't just the ball, you know, and guys were coming back, uh, you know, in spring training or the beginning of the season from the last season, and you look at him and you're going, oh, my God, you know, he's a whole lot bigger than he was last year. Um, so, you know, I, I think we started to take notice of it, obviously, but honestly, you know, from a pitching standpoint, there wasn't a lot you could do about it, you know? I mean, it wasn't like you could say, hey, you know, you're cheating and that home run you just hit uh, doesn't count. I mean, it, it didn't work that way. We just – you know, I, I think in a large part, we honestly, yeah, you took note of guys and you had to, you, you had to plan accordingly in terms of pitching. Like I say, knowing that, all right, more and more guys can take you out of the ballpark opposite field. So it changed how you pitched a little bit. Um, but really, it was just still about trying trying to make pitches and get guys out. And, and, you know, so it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't the kind of thing that you could necessarily put your finger on and say, well, here's how we fix it. Um, we just had to keep pitching and tried to find, try to find a way to survive it, so to speak. And, you know, I think we all did, but, um, you know, there's, there's no doubt that you look back in that era. Yeah. We probably gave up a few more home runs and a few more runs and maybe even lost some games that we shouldn't have lost. But, um, other than that, there just wasn't a whole lot you could do about it. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. You know, it's something that's out of your control to an extent when that's going on, but you mentioned preparation and, you know, kind of coming up with different ways to attack hitters and Benny and I both played baseball growing up and big, big baseball nerds. Um, so something that I wanted to ask you a little bit about is this trend. Now, a lot of people are talking about, you know, tunneling pitches. So having pitches come from the same arm angle uh, that look the same and then have different movements off, you know, that initial release point. And that's something, you know, watching some of your film, uh, it seemed like you were able to really tunnel kind of your, your two seam and your change up together, you know, same arm angle, same release point, both kept, kept them both down in the zone. And then one would break left and one would break right. Uh, so it seems like you were a little bit ahead of the trend with that. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little, a little bit about your sequencing and kind of how you approached hitters and the interplay between your change up and your two seamer. Yeah, no, I mean, if, I think if you go back and look at video of myself and, and Greg, uh, Greg probably a little bit more than me, um, but that's what we did. You know, you, you tried to throw pitches on both sides of the plate uh, that looked the same, uh, and then the hitter had to figure out, okay, is it a fastball, is it a changeup, is it a curveball? Um, you know, you watch video of Greg, particularly against a left-handed hitter, you know, he had the added benefit of a cutter, so he had that that two seamer he could start at a at a left handed hitter's elbow that would ride back in the strike zone. He had that same cutter that would start on that same plane and then move in on a hitter's hands. And then he had a changeup that would start on that same plane and then dive and and finish you know down and out of the zone. So you know theoretically a hitter's having to decide okay is that ball going to stay straight? Is it going to come in on my hands or is it going to move away from me? Uh, and the key to it all is obviously arm speed and making everything look the same. And, and, you know, I, I was good at doing the same thing with my sinker and my change up to right-handed hitters on, on the away side of the plate. I got better at it uh, as time went on in my career and I started pitching inside to right-handed hitters more. So I got better at doing it on that side of the plate. But yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's the essence of pitching. If you can take, you know, that tunnel on either side of the plate and throw, two or three, however many pitches you have uh, in that tunnel um, as frequently as possible, and, and they're all doing something different, I mean, that's the essence of making life hard for a hitter, you know, because he's having to decide, like, like I said, okay, is this ball going to stay straight, move left, move right? Is it 88 miles an hour? Is it 78 miles an hour? You know, what is it? And, you know, that, that was what we had to do and tried to do in terms of uh, keeping hitters off balance. Going off the tunneling again and uh, similar about trends and, you know, just changing eye level and it's all about the movement and everything, different pitch speeds. A guy I love watching a lot is Lucas Giolito right now. And he, um, 
you know, throws his change up up in the zone, which a lot of guys don't do. And it's kind of, he's talked about a little bit. It's with, because of the tunneling, they expect it. It looks like his fastball. I just wondered if you have any thoughts about, you know, like the off-speed stuff, throwing it high in the zone, or if it, it just doesn't even matter because of that tunneling effect. All right. If he's able to throw his change up up in the zone and get away with it, he's a brave man. He's braver than me, I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, look, you know, I think that's part of um, – what we did as pitchers, um, you know, that evolved our games, you know, when you, when you go out there and you throw 100 pitches in a game, you know, our, our goal, you know, Greg and I used to talk all the time about throwing a perfect game in the sense of not statistically a perfect game, but if you throw 100 pitches in a game, how many do you actually throw the way you want to throw it? Meaning you're not throwing every one for a strike. There are times that you're trying to expand the zone or you're trying to miss inside on a guy or you're whatever. So how many times you actually execute a pitch the way you want to pit or you want to throw it? And, and you obviously want to get that number as high as you can and get your mistakes down as low as you can. Inevitably, you're going to throw some pitches that you don't want to throw the way that you didn't throw the way you wanted to. For instance, you'll throw a, a backup slider uh, or you'll throw a hanging breaking ball or you throw, you know, a change up that didn't land in the right spot. And, and I think the key for us was, we, when we would do that, we would take note of, oh, wow, look at the reaction that hitter had, right? And, and it would tell you something. So, you know, there was always a thing. We always used to joke about, you know, our, our pitching and when we were attacking guys that, you know, if you're going to hang a slider or you're going to hang a curveball or you're going to hang a changeup, hang it higher than high because if it's high, if it's above high, they can't really do anything with it. You know, if it hangs kind of in the, in the happy area, then, yeah, the ball goes a long way. But if you can get just above, you know, it still looks really good to a hitter, but it's too high for them to really do anything. But, man, the, the ability to do that on purpose, you know, it, it's much like the, the greatest pitch in baseball is a backup slider. The problem is you can't do it on purpose, you know. <laughs> and and it, it's when you watch it, that's kind of what I'm talking about. When you see a pitcher throw a backup slider – and, and you see a hitter's reaction because he recognizes spin. He knows it's going to go what it's supposed to do, and it doesn't do it. You know, the reaction is like, hey, what the hell? What was that, right? And, and so, yeah, I, I, there, are, there are things that, again, a, a hitter will show you. But like I said, I, I threw my fair share of hanging changeups that were higher than high, and I got away with them. But I can honestly say I never thought about trying to do that on purpose. Um, but there were certainly things that, you know, like for me, uh, I might, I might throw a fastball in on a right-handed hitter and I'm trying to go in and it's and it's actually like maybe on the inner third of the plate and, and the hitter jumps out of the way, like that's about to hit him. And you're like, Oh my God, if he thought that was inside, I've got <laughs> eight more inches that I can go in there, you know? So that kind of thing. Um, you know, I was like, even for me, I started throwing, kind of the taboo stuff. Um, you know, I started throwing change-ups to lefties. I started throwing change-ups into lefties, into righties. And, you know, some of it was because of mistakes that I made and saw hitters' reactions. You know, I mean, for me, a, a change-up into a lefty became a big pitch for me later in my career. And, you, and you're just not supposed to throw lefties down and in. Um, and I get it. It's where they like the ball. But I can, I can tell you that I, that I did it a couple times by accident. And either A, saw a really kind of goofy reaction from the hitter, or B, they would kill the ball but pull it foul. There was no way they could keep it fair. And that to me became, okay, well, if I can do that on purpose, then okay, yeah, I'm going to get – they might smoke the ball, but there's no way they can keep it fair. So it's an easy strike. It's an easy way to get inside. It's an easy way to make them conscious inside. Um, and it was something that, you know – I like I said, it happened by accident. And then I went to spring training the following year and I started doing it and exactly what I thought was going to happen did. Um, so yeah, stuff like that, I think you have to pay attention to, but long story short or short story long, however you want to put it, he's a braver man than me if he's throwing higher than I <laughs> um, So kind of along the same line, you know, you mentioned how you started to develop that pitch, realized, you know, that was something that was effective and it's an adjustment that you made. Uh, you also for lack of a better term, you ate innings. I mean, just numbers that people, you don't see anymore. Uh, the year you won the Cy Young Award winner, there were only four times you threw less than six innings. That's insane by any standards, especially today. 
uh, you know, where the analytics that I, the analytics say don't let somebody face the lineup three times. When you would go through a lineup three or four times, you know, if you're throwing complete games, you have to. Um, you know, you're throwing seven, eight innings. You're, you're going to see guys three or four times. Would you be conscious of that? And would you make adjustments to your approach, like how you would sequence pitches or how you would attack hitters? Or, you know, did you have something that was working and you would just let it ride? Uh, uh, all of the above. Um, you know, I think for me, mo- most of my game plan boiled down to me knowing what I wanted to do, and I was I was hell bent that I was going to do what I wanted to do better than the hitter was going to do what he wanted to do. I mean, that was that was the essence of what I did, right? I I didn't have a complicated game plan at least early in my career. It was away, away, away with an occasional fastball in. Um, I didn't really care that guys were looking for a pitch, it, it, particularly my changeup. If you want to look for my best pitch, go ahead, look for it. But I felt like if you're looking for it and I throw it the way that I want to, you're not going to be able to do anything with it anyway. Now, if I make a mistake, that's on me. So for me, it boiled down to just thinking I was going to execute better than, than the hitter was able to execute. So that was the big part of it. There are certainly times where, yeah, you, I mean, you, you'll go through a lineup two or three times and you, you go through the lineup for the third time. Yes, I promise you, you're 100% aware of how you got guys out. and you're also aware of certain guys, okay, third time through the lineup, yeah, I'm going to throw a little wrinkle at it. Other guys, no, you don't have to, you know, and, and, and I think that's, that's kind of what drives me crazy sometimes because I hear this with analytics that, oh, guys can't flip the lineup three times and there's no way they can flip the lineup the fourth time because, they, you know, they can't get guys out the same way. And, and my thing is, why not? Why can't you? If you know there's a way to attack a hitter, then if you're telling me I, that a guy can't do it three times and you're telling me he's not good enough to do it three times, not that he can't get that hitter out that way again. He just, he can't, you don't think he's good enough as a pitcher to execute it again. I can promise you, I, th- I went through lineups where I, if I pitched a complete game, I promise you I got guys out in the lineup three or four times the same way all night. Absolutely I did. Now the notion today, like I said, is that well, guys can't do that. I don't know that it's that they can't do it or they're just not capable of doing it, you know? And, and I think a lot of it is because the command in today's game is not nearly as good. Yeah, the stuff is off the charts, uh, but the command is not what it was. And, and I think, too, part of the problem is, you know, we, we always approach getting a hitter out through our strengths. We're going to do what we do. And if a hitter has a weakness that we can attack and it matches up with my strengths, great. You know, example being, hey, if a guy's a, uh, you know, a bad curve breaking ball hitter, well, I didn't throw a lot of breaking balls, so I'm not going to go out there and just start flipping breaking balls up there because that guy can't hit it. I'm going to do my thing, and if he shows me he can beat me at my game, then I'll make an adjustment. I think too often today, I see hitters try to attack a hit, uh, I see pitchers try to attack hitters' weaknesses when that may not really match up with what they do, you know, and it kind of gets back to the you know, even the high changeup thing. If you're good enough to do that, then hats off, right? But I see a lot of guys in today's game that have really poor fastball command and they're trying to pitch up in the zone with their fastball. And, and to me, you're, you're, you're now you're pitching in an area where your margin for error is so small and guys have spotty command and now we're going to ask them to pitch to an area that <laughs> quite frankly there's not a lot of room to get away with mistakes I mean it doesn't make sense to me a lot of times so um you know I, I think that's what we did like I said it was we we took what we did well that was our foundation if a hitter showed that he was going to beat us at our game we would do that um you know yes I felt like I could get a guy out three or four times in a night the same way not all nine guys in a lineup. I mean, you know, typically your third, fourth, and fifth place hitters, you know, they're there for a reason. So you're going to have to do some things differently. Um, you know, you might have – maybe I struck a guy out on a 2-2 changeup in his, in his second at bat, and now in his third at bat I got him 2-2 again, and he's looking changeup, and I throw a fastball in. Um, you know, little things like that. But it's not – they weren't wholesale changes. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, that, it's super interesting to just hear you kind of talk about that because, like you said, you know, guys don't even get the opportunity to do it nowadays um, to to go through that. Yeah. Line. You know, and, and I think, look at, I think part of it is it, it's not all their fault. As much as I hate saying that, 
Um, but you know, these kids today, they're brought up on velocity, 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 that, that they know it. Everybody knows it. If you're not, if you're not throwing, you know, low to mid nineties as a lefty or mid to high nineties as a righty, you're not getting drafted. So these kids know it and everything they do developmentally is about adding velocity. There's very little about pitching. It, it's, it's how hard can I throw? That's what's going to get me drafted or that's what's going to get me to college. Um, and then once they get, if they are fortunate enough to get to the professional level, you know, they're being, they're being brought up in such a way as, as they're being told they can't flip a lineup for a third time. They're being told that they can't go past the sixth inning. And, you know, look, if you're told that long enough, then you're going to start to believe it. And that's how you're going to be conditioned, right? It, it's similar to my generation. You know, my generation was more, we started counting pitches and they started doing all that stuff and paying attention to that. Um, you know, we started with specialization in the bullpen with closers and set up guys. So, you know, for us, it was, you do everything you could to get to the seventh inning and, and, and be able to hand the ball over at minimum to your closer or to your setup guy. And then your closer well, I, I know the generation before us thought that that was soft. You know, those guys were going, you know, 350 innings a year, throwing both games with a double header. I mean, they were, <laughs> they were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. But I'm firmly convinced that if you're brought up a certain way and developed a certain way, that's what you're going to get. Those guys before me were developed on four-man rotations, no pitch, no pitch counts, and they just did their thing. We, I was groomed under a pitch count. I was groomed on how many innings you threw and that kind of stuff. So that's kind of what you, that's what you settle into. And I think that's what guys in today's game are settling into. They're, they're settling into the fact that, hey, if I go five innings and flip the lineup twice, I had a great game. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. It's a great way to look at it too. Yeah. Um, so if you don't mind, we have a couple more questions, if that's all right. Probably yeah. you know, no, more, no more than a couple minutes. But, uh, you know, we would be remiss if we didn't mention that you're a four-time Silver Slugger Award winner. And I was wondering if you could take us through your home run at bat, 1995. And I just want to know how soon after that did Nike call you <laughs> to do the chicks dig the long ball? <laughs> I don't think the commercial had anything to do with the home run, but um, you know, it was uh, it was an interesting night. I mean, that was you know, 95 was we came back from the strike of 94, and you know, I was public enemy number one or number two, you know, 1A or 1B in baseball because my involvement as a player rep. And, um, you know, the fans were pretty hard on me in Atlanta all year long. And, and um, I felt like that was kind of the end of it for me. Um, that night, um, hitting that home run off of John, John Smiley, um, left center field, opposite field home run, um, ended up being the game winner, I believe. I feel like that was kind of the end for the strike for me. Like people kind of at that point let it go, um, and they were on my side, so to speak. I could be wrong, but that was the feeling I got. Now, as far as the home run went, I really didn't get to enjoy it, to be perfectly honest with you, because um, when I hit it, I knew I hit it good, um, but I was thinking double. Uh, there was no thought in my mind that if I was going to hit a home, ever hit a home run, I was going to hit an opposite field home run. Um, I always felt like if I ever get lucky enough to hit a home run, I'm going to end up somehow pulling a ball and it's going to be right down the right field line. Um, but that one, I got it and it carried. Uh, so I was sprinting to get a double. Uh, and then I got just about the second base and I it was like, oh my God, that went out of the park. So. <laughs> You know, I didn't, I didn't break it down to much of a uh, home run trot. It was more of the Scott Rowland home run trot where I sprinted around the bases. Um, and then, you know, it, it's weird because you get in the dugout and you've got all this adrenaline from hitting a home run and everybody's, you know, high-fiving you, doing the whole thing. And then when that kind of dies down, you sit down and it's like, oh, my God, I got to go back out there and pitch. It's a still a wonderful game. <laughs> You know, so, yeah. you know, the, the next, my next train of thought was, okay, now don't go out there and screw this up by screwing up the game. So uh, I kind of had to shut the emotional side and the adrenaline down as best I could and, and get back to focusing on what I was getting paid to do, which was go out there and pitch. Yeah, you never really even think about that because whenever all these pitchers now go, they're like DeGrom or Stroman and they hit their first home run, they just, after the game, it's just all excitement about that. You never even really think about the fact that they have to calm themselves down and go back out on the mound and just shut it down after that too. So, yeah, and it's not like we get a lot of practice at it because we're not hitting a lot of home runs. So, right. <laughs> Yeah. 
So um, we'll do uh, – we have – you know, obviously we're big baseball guys, pitcher right there. So our last round of like rapid fire questions, we like to call them quick pitches. All right. So um, the first one we got is what's the favorite ballpark? To, what was your favorite ballpark to play at on the road? Um, I would say probably Wrigley Field. Uh, not the greatest place to pitch when the wind was blowing out. Um, but just, you know, Chicago, the environment and um, old school baseball was, it was a really cool place. Awesome. Um, kind of in a similar vein, what was your favorite city to visit on the road? Probably San Diego. Um, weather was great. Um, you know, never, never rained, never a bad day out there and a uh, good place to pitch and some pretty good golf courses. Hmm. Now, so I, I think I told, I told Matt, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this one already, but All right. what was the best ballpark slash locker room food spread for like away players? Oh man. Um, there were a couple. I mean, look, it's, it's always hard to argue with New York cause they're bringing, you know, authentic Italian stuff in there and, and all that stuff. Uh, but I'll tell you one of my favorite road meals of all time always was getaway day in Houston. Um, he, uh, he made the, the, uh, Southern country fried, uh, country fried steak. Oh my God. It was so good. So <laughs> that sounds awesome. Yeah. That sounds great. <laughs> um, who was your favorite hitter to face and who was your least favorite hitter to face? Favorite hitter was Brad Osmus. Um, for whatever reason, Brad could not get a hit off of me. And then conversely, you know, look, the obvious Barry Bonds, Tony Gwynn. I mean, those guys were, were obviously, if there's a tying run on second base, you don't want to see those guys up. But the guy that wore me out more than anybody was, was Mike Redmond, catcher for the Marlins. Um, it didn't matter. Uh, he started every time I pitched and pretty, pretty guaranteed that the over under on hits was going to be three. And most of the time I would have taken the over. Gotcha. Um, so in today's game, if you're sitting down, relax and watch the game, just who's someone you always love watching the pitch? Um, I love watching DeGrom. Um, I love watching, uh, Mike Sirocco with the Braves. Um, you know, Kershaw is always fun to watch, obviously. Um, you know, got a lot of respect for his game, being a lefty and how he goes about his business. Um, you know, I love watching uh, I love watching Scherzer's compete level when he goes out there. Um, so, you know, those are the guys. But I, but I think for me, you know, you'd be hard-pressed uh, other than, like I say, being a homer and, and wanting to watch Mike Soroka pitch every time he gets out there. Um, you know, if you get a chance to watch the Jake DeGrom pitch, uh, it's something special. I mean, he's that rare ability to throw the ball hard but still change speeds really well and locate, which is why he's so good. Yeah, I saw a wild. Yeah, he's yeah. definitely awesome. Wild stat with DeGrom. He has more RBIs than earned runs allowed this year, which is just insane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, poor guy. I mean, you know, I think those of us that – can look at it from afar, just kind of laugh at some of the games that he lost or doesn't get a win in. I'm sure it's probably not that funny for him anymore. I'm sure it's wearing him out, but uh, he's he's been pretty special. All right, one last quick question. If you could steal one person's pitch and add it to your repertoire, whose would it be and what pitch? Um, it probably would have been Mariano Rivera's cutter. Um, you know, for me – Having the command that I had with my other two pitches, if I could have had that pitch and had one more weapon against a right-handed hitter, that would have been that would have been fun. Awesome, great answer. Yeah, that, that it's hard to argue against Moe's cutter. Yeah, uh, they they know it's coming too every time, and they still can't hit it. Multi <laughs> multi slider would be on the list too. So one of those two. Gotcha. Dale, thank you so much. That's all the questions we have. We really appreciate you taking the time. It was awesome to get the chance to talk with you and get the chance to know you a little bit. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Happy to do it.